and thank you to the organizers for having this uh, event and also inviting um, me to speak. What I'm going to do is speak in English and Guru is going to translate in between. I apologize, my Tamil is very poor and, and won't be able to do justice to this topic. Um, and what I've been asked to do, and in, in the interest of time, I know we've gone quite, uh, quite a lot into the time. In the interest of time, I'm going to try to raise key issues, issues that are important at this moment, um, six years post-war, but also issues that have come up in the legal realm, in, in the policy human rights issues, but also things we should be looking at moving forward. Um, and this issue of right to memory is something that's come up quite a bit in the last couple of months, especially in a space, in, in a context where space has opened up, but also because we've had quite a few visitors to Sri Lanka who raised this issue and kept the pressure on. So it's both Sri Lankans as well as internationals. And one person in particular who said, and reiterated the importance of memory, of truth, justice, reconciliation, was the UN Special Rapporteur on the issue, who visited Jaffna as well a couple of weeks ago, and made the point that you cannot have reconciliation. You cannot expect us to move forward if you don't look at what's happened in the past. And any process that happens here has to be also a victim-centered process. So those are basic principles that he put out. And this is not a new message. The High Commissioner who visited Sri Lanka two years, or one and a half years ago, she said the same thing. So these messages have been in Sri Lanka by international as well as national actors. But in terms of what is memory, what is the meaning of remembrance, recognition, acknowledgement, and from a legal perspective as well, where do we stand? Because we can just say, this is right to memory and just move on. Where does it stand? And internationally, the UN General Assembly recognized this in a basic guidelines that the General Assembly adopted, which talks about remedies and reparations for violations, gross violations of international human rights law and IHL, international humanitarian law. This was in 2005, that's 10 years ago. Since then, it's progressed. And now we have four pillars of transitional justice. Truth, justice, reparations, and non-recurrence. And memorialization, memory, comes within the reparations. But to be very clear, it's not mutually exclusive that one doesn't reflect the other that these are all reinforcing. So without truth, you cannot have justice. Without truth, justice, you cannot have reparations. And the whole issue of non-recurrence, addressing culture of impunity, is representative of the other three pillars as well. So these four are important in terms of our own understanding of what right to memory and what right to remember is. I 
போருக்கு பிரிய சூழல் என்பது நான்கு முக்கிய தூண்களை அடிப்படையாக கொண்டு பார்க்கப்படுவதென்று சொல்லப்படுகிறது முதலாவது உண்மை இரண்டாவது நீதி மூன்றாவது ரெப்பரேஷன் சென்றவர்கள் அதுக்கு உடனடி தமிழ் சொல்லாக இணைக்கப்படுவது நட்டல் ஆனால் இது நட்டல் என்பது வந்து உடனடியாக தமிழில் ஏதோ பணம் சம்பந்தமான விஷயமாக பார்க்கப்படுகிறார் இந்த நட்டல் ஏற்பட்ட இழப்புக்கு ஈடு செய்தல் இழப்பீடு என்பதாக பார்க்கவில்லை நட்டல் என்று பார்க்கிறார் நட்டல் வரும் பகுதி இழப்பீடு என்ற வார்த்தையை நான் பயன்படுத்துகிறேன் மற்றது நான்காவது நான் வைப்பது முதல நடந்தது முதல நடக்காமல் இருப்பதை தடுப்பது talked about what memory has meant in different contexts we looked at south africa cambodia rwanda and i want to take you to one and latin america i think it's very important for sri lanka to look at some of the lessons from argentina chile guatemala peru and the list is long it's it's very sad such a list exists when one talks about history and political violence but i want to take you to two sentences a chilean playwright ariel dorfman um raised in his work the death of a maiden and two very relevant sentences for all of us in this room but everyone to think about and his sentences were how do you keep the past alive without becoming its prisoner how do we forget it without risking its repetition in the future so he raises a very very valid point that we also need to think about how do we move forward without becoming a hostage to the past in terms of we can all talk about what's happened in the past and it's very important to talk about the past that is a critical element in reconciliation but not to be so bogged down that you forget that there are things that can happen and it's a very delicate process and it's a process that it doesn't happen overnight it has to be done slowly but in a process that is inclusive that everyone from the south to the north to the east are involved and i think it's also important it was raised by other speakers as well the whole issue of space for different narratives the different narratives of Uh, and it's it's like it's um the nigerian author chimamanda adichi talks about the dangers of the single story we were going there in the last 10 years where the state was doing their best to create their own official narrative we heard the terms of humanitarian operation we heard the terms of zero civilian casualties that there are no minorities in sri lanka this is the official nar- narrative the previous government was trying to create there was immense pushback from different groups from civil society from religious actors from trade unions artists but you know when you have one actor that's so powerful and tries to take over that official space then it becomes very difficult for others to work in so it's extremely important to keep the balance of the past and the future but also the space of multiple narratives of competing histories because there's no one history that is correct everyone has a version but there has to be space for people to come together and the whole issue of power because memory is power end of the day memory can send a message as to what happened and counter an official narrative of anyone's narrative but it's also a power that needs to be very very carefully held because whose narrative is more important whose stories are more important whose stories get forgotten and this is one of the things we should not be falling into that trap of where civil society is concerned is that space is there for everyone from women to minorities everyone should be heard 
and their point need to be taken in moving forward. Otherwise, you repeat the same mistakes we had before in the dangers of a single story. And I would say, I mean, Ruki highlighted this on the religious side. So I would just say, it's we had attacks against different communities, different religious groups. The whole attack of the Khatan Kodi Mosque showed the attack on the Pesale Church, the Dalada Maligawa, this affected different communities. Those are different narratives. So in terms of memory, in terms of remembering, those all need to be captured. We may not like it, but these, this is where you make the space for memory. So we get to the question of what is memory now and what's happening. And I wanted to also talk about some of the past initiatives, but since we don't have much time, the whole issue of what is the present government's policy and where do we fit in, in terms of remembrance, in terms of memory, in terms of truth, justice, accountability, and reconciliation. Now, we had, you know, we've had an election, we've had new actors, some of the old actors are still remaining, and some of the old policies are still remaining as well. Um, what I would like to raise is some of the new things that have come up or have been promised that we need to think about. The government, due to various pressures, has promised a credible domestic process. Now, we don't know what this credible domestic process is to, in, to entail. We are actually concerned that if there's not reform, this credible domestic process would be like the so many other commissions that previous governments have appointed. It will be a failure. we have actually having, uh, at present, a commission on missing persons that came to Jaffna. And there's been boycotts, there's been protests, CPA, we've critiqued it. Actually, there's a lot of literature at the back of the room on these issues that you're most welcome to take. The point is that with a credible domestic process, we have to be very careful as to what this could mean. But it, this is also an opportunity to push our concerns, to raise the issues that when it comes to memory, these basic things need to be understood and done. And one possible positive move is there is now an Office of National Unity. 
It was first the task force, special task force on reconciliation, which has now been converted into an office of national unity, headed by the former president, Chandrika Bandaranaika Kumaratunga. Now we've engaged in Colombo as to what this office should be, what its mandate is, what it, what, how they should be consulting, and they seem to be interested in taking the whole issue of reparations forward, which means memorialization and memory. What we have to be thinking and pushing them is that that process is not just a Colombo driven process that a few individuals decide. It's important that they come here, they go to the other areas, it is a consultative process. But it's also important to be very clear as to what is important that they do. There are a long list of recommendations. The Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission has many pages. I would say even looking at the All Island Disappearances Commission of the 1990s, now that's a document that was done nearly two decades ago, but it's so relevant in terms of recognizing that violations were across the board and that remembrance, memory, is part of reconciliation. They actually say there has to be a wall of reconciliation with names of victims, regardless of what their background of, regardless of how they were killed, that needs to be recognized as a basic step moving forward. So coming back to the present move, with this Office of National Unity, one of the things we need to think about is what are the new things they can do? We have said there has to be a reparations package and policy done in the correct process that captures the views of people here, the grievances, for example, the disappearances, the detainees, the land grabs, all of them. It's not enough just to set up a center for women-headed households, which was done by the prime minister last month, but no one knows what that center is supposed to do. No one knows how women are supposed to go and engage and what kind of assistance they're supposed to get. So it's not enough just to have the officers. It's also substance and it's also moving forward that is important that we need to be thinking about. We also have, as I mentioned, a commission on missing persons. That has been there since 2013. We have monitored every sitting, every public sitting. There are others in this room that have taken women to meet the commissioners, to raise grievances. But we start with the point, this is a flawed process, structurally as well as procedurally. And there are things like translations, there are things like independence that need to be addressed. But one thing you cannot forget, even if there are boycotts or protests, one cannot forget there are thousands of people who have made applications. There's over 21,000 who made complaints to this specific commission for various reasons. Now that's not saying this is a great process. It's the only process to be heard. And one also, if you go for these commission sittings and sit for even a few sittings, you will hear the right to truth. We want to know what happened to our loved ones. We want to know what happened to our husbands, our wives, our sons. So it, it, there's no way one can ignore that basic fundamental call of right to know, right to truth, and to be recognized. And if we can use those narratives, and that's not just one community, just different narratives. It sends a strong message that that's, that an, that's an issue that cannot be ignored. But the problem with all these institutions is it doesn't give that space for us to go and push them even more. But as citizens, I think we need to go to the next level. This discussion is important. I've been told there's someone outside taking photographs of everyone who's coming in. I don't know for what purpose. Maybe they have a memorialization process. I don't know. But it's important that those people who are watching, who are monitoring, also understand these discussions happen. But these discussions don't end here today. What happens next is something we all need to think about, because otherwise it's just another conversation. And in terms of just to end, I would say 
There is that the Geneva, there is a Human Rights Council, there's a report that's going to be tabled in September. We are talk, uh, talking about possible elections in the next few months. There's a lot of developments that's going to happen, both in terms of political, but in terms of accountability as well. It's also an opportunity for us not to be sidelined. Just to end, I want to raise one issue from Argentina that we should all listen and think about. The mothers and the grandmothers, the madres and the abuelas in Argentina, who were searching for their disappeared children and grandchildren, went every day, not in an organized manner at the beginning, every day to a place called the Plaza de Mayo. It's a central place. During the dictatorship, I mean, we complain about space. They did not have space. They went every week, protested, which became such a strong movement, they are the ones who led to the UN Working Group on Disappearances. They made that happen. And they came out, there was a, civil, the, a commission on disappearances that came out with a very strong report called Nunca Mas, Never Again. That has, what Ruki showed was in Guatemala, that came from Argentina. This is driven by people affected, by families, by civil society. They didn't have a plan, but they got there. 30 years after, last year I met someone who was reunited with their grandson 30 years after. So the struggle doesn't end overnight. The struggle will continue. But it's us being also sharp in what do we want with memory. And not to be manipulated in terms of other people's agendas as to what memory could mean. But what do you want in terms of memory? And to be very, very strong in being heard. Thank you.